Gresham College presents Measures Beyond Money, The Long Finance Autumn Conference, Part 1, Introduction, by Professor Michael Minelli. Um, long Finance, um, just before we get cracking, I wanted to just uh, talk for a moment about uh, where we are and why we're having today's conference. Um, the Long Finance Initiative began with this conundrum, when would we know our financial system is working? And I just wanted to spend a second retracing our steps. Uh, when we founded Zien back in 1994, Ian Harris and I uh, were writing about systemic weaknesses that we saw, accounting, sustainability, transparency, credit ratings, liquidity, regulation, you name it. Uh, and today, this movement has grown with the help of thousands of people, a kitchen cabinet, um, many of whose members are here today. Um, and we're now numbering just short of 10,000 people who are involved and about 600 on the uh, social media that, we, that we're using. So it's a fantastic uh, initiative, and we've published a tremendous amount of things, uh, ranging from confidence accounting, index on carbon bonds, insured utility banks, pensions indemnity insurances, uh, restructuring mortgage markets, a lot of very different things. And at this morning's Meta Conference workshop, a group of 30 people got together and spoke about issues to do with uh, money, externalities, and social issues of trust and equity. So there's a lot happening uh, and a lot that you can get involved in. At our spring 2011 conference, uh, Dr. Tim Morgan talked about dangerous exponentials, uh, which is in many ways related to the very famous sustainability question, uh, equation, sorry, IPAT, that the impact equals population times affluence times technology. So your environmental impact grows as your population, your affluence, or your use of uh, technology grows. The planet is only so big, uh, can only burn so many hydrocarbons, and can hold uh, only so many humans. We can debate these exponential curves, and will, uh, but global warming activist or skeptic, it's clear that some of our ex exponential curves must break. So today we tend to explore some of these problems that we face measuring ourselves beyond money as these curves expand outward through time. When we look at the various interactions of the crises since 2007, we see that our values are also changing rapidly. And digging a bit deeper, our values are really just our monetary system. And as our predominant monetary system at the moment is based on fiat currency, we are trading tax debts amongst ourselves and our children. So one of our biggest problems, uh, partially addressed in our eternal coin thinking, is that we don't actually have a theory of value, as Brandon Davies often says. Uh, could we ever build a coin that kept its value forever? And today we intend to explore some other thinking about what might these eternal values be. Since the 1990s, uh, significant efforts in the social, environmental, and economic sciences, as well as within governments and supranational, and supranational institutions, have centered on how could we complement some of the well-established national account indicators, such as gross domestic product or GDP. The attention in these areas is focused uh, particularly on how well-being can be measured in a comprehensive sense that captures the social, environmental, and ethical dimensions into which it feeds. Some research has been conducted by the World Bank, the OECD, and the Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress do provide some important insights on how this is just very multidimensional. Well-being uh, involves many, many different measures of performance. Now, to be fair to GDP, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Simon Kuznets, who was instrumental back in the 1930s in helping the U.S. Department of Commerce develop G GNP, as it was then uh, known, gross national product, he himself criticized using uh, GNP as a proxy for standard of living. He pointed out that the welfare of a nation can scarcely be inferred from a measure of national income. Now, while GDP has often been used to assess material well-being, its relevance has been increasingly questioned. Since GDP is a market production measure, it has been suggested that other national account indicators relating to income and consumption should also be taken into account. The understanding of well-being has evolved to encompass objective components in the form of conditions and capabilities, as they're called in the jargon, as well as some subjective components which relate to our individual perceptions of our own well-being. And then we have other indicators relating to education and health, for instance, which can be used to assess this potentially objectively. But subjective well-being is measured by uh, assessing how individuals feel about their own states. 
originally postulated in 1994 by Sarah Geldin and Steer, well-being supposedly arises from the presence of key capital stocks and the flow of benefits or goods and services that these provide to society. So you have a two-side diagram here, objective well-being on the left and subjective well-being on the right, believing basically that the factors on the left at some, in some way correlate with the, the perception of well-being on the right. The capital stock model tries to break this down into four types of capital, physical capital, natural capital, human capital, and social capital. So physical capital are those assets that people use to produce goods and services, machines, factories, buildings. Natural capital is the totality of the environment, the natural resources. Human capital is the health and productive potential of the people, including their own health and education. Social capital are the social networks and institutions that support the society, including concepts like norms and trust. Financial capital, which doesn't feature in, in those four, is often cited as either a fifth type of capital, stocks, bonds, currency deposits, but there's a debate as to whether it should be stand alone or with the financial system as part of social capital. Now, whether these positive levels of well-being can be sustained over time depends on whether these key capital stocks on the left are, are maintained and can be passed on to future generations. Now, many aspects of this, frankly, somewhat simplistic model are debated. These include both the theoretical conception of the model and its practical implication through the measurement of capital stocks and flows. The degree of substitutability between the different types of capital is contentious and has led to two distinct conceptions of sustainability, rather related to markets, the weak and the strong. And because certain benefits are essential to life, for example, clean water, a stable climate, there are also difficulties in defining critical thresholds for each type of capital, beyond which this capital should not be depleted or degraded. Another big concern is the appropriate unit of measurement for the different types of capital and the subsequent comparable, comparability of these units. For example, the use of money as a single unit is problematic given the lack of market values or established indirect valuation techniques for some of these forms of capital. We've seen this in, in things like the TEAB report for the UN on biodiversity. Equally, there is an ethical debate underlying the principle of measuring capital stocks and flows, treating nature as if it's just another form of capital, as though humans are indifferent to whether or not nature exists as long as they're personal well-being is otherwise assured. And money itself, of course, is an anthropomorphic self-referential measure. And it's here that I always love Henny Youngman's quip, what's the point of happiness? Happiness can't buy you money. <laughs> so once you look through the lens of long finance, you realize that many of today's sustainability issues arise because our core risk-reward transfer system finance isn't really yet capable of handling these long-term risk-reward transfers uh, about either objective or subjective well-being, as well as understanding what are the capital flows that sustain it. Now, these are the issues we hope to discuss today. We'll begin with a fascinating presentation on how the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and others continue to develop the 1950s thinking of Howard T. Odom and his concepts of emergy, synonymous spelling, uh, Dennis White will lay out the background to Emergy, including comparisons with other measures of well-being. Could Emergy be an eternal point for some of us? We'll then have a panel where we'll be joined by two others and a discussion. And then after our first panel and break, Professor Paul Eakins will be warming us up for a second panel on green growth, including the policy and science challenges. As ever, we count on interaction with you, the participants, and the panel. So be sharp. <laughs> Time is short. Our program is long. So as we say in commerce, to business, Dennis White. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.